Hi, I'm Walter Isaacson, and welcome to History and the Law, the course I'm teaching with Blake Gilpin. And today I'm going to do a introductory lecture that's going to give one of the frames that I'm going to be using as we march through this course. Sort of the arc of the course, and in some ways it is, controversially, sometimes yes, sometimes no, the arc of American history. It's the arc of how we got our rights. Some of those rights from free speech to free press to the freedom to worship as we, as we want to. Those were things we didn't start off with, but gradually over the course of the years, over the course of generations in the United States, there's been progress in fits and starts towards getting those rights for all people. And those rights were sort of part of the mission statement we started with. That mission statement, of course, being the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, we, we look at that mission statement, there it is, the Declaration, and it's pretty inspiring. But of course, we think back at the people who wrote it, they didn't actually follow the mission statement the way we now interpret it. And there's that wonderful second sentence, probably the greatest sentence ever written by the hand of mankind, by the hand of humans. It was written by a committee. The committee included Thomas Jefferson, who got to do the first draft, John Adams, and my friend Benjamin Franklin. It may have been the last time Congress created a great committee, and that was truly a great committee. But let's look at that second sentence that sentence that uh, pretty much says, here is what we're going to all be about. And it says, we hold these truths. And then wait a minute, here's the first draft. The first draft says, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. But you look right there and there's the backslashes of Ben Franklin's printer's pen. And he's saying, self-evident. He writes in self-evident. He explains to Adams and Jefferson, that we're trying to create a new type of nation that does not base its rights on the dictates and dogma of any religion. Its rights come from rationality and reason and from the consent of the governed. But then this sentence in the first draft goes on, as Jefferson's handwriting, we hold these truths to be self-evident, as Ben Franklin wrote, that all men are created equal and then there's sort of, because of this creation, they get endowed. There you see John Adams's handwriting. And he writes, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So even in the editing of one half of one sentence, you can see already they're wrestling with, where do our rights come from? How are we gonna expand them? Do they come from the dictates of a religion? No. They come from, they're self-evident. They're about the contract we make when we enter a state, but also they're endowed in us by, as they later put it, nature or nature's God. They weren't trying to make this religious, but they were trying to say, we're each endowed as individuals with certain liberties and certain rights. And the uh, section goes on that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, you have to remember when they wrote this, those who were allowed to vote were only white male property owners. And there wasn't a whole lot of freedom of the press. You had to be authorized in many ways to run a newspaper. And there wasn't what we would call freedom of speech because even if you spoke the truth, you could be accused of seditious libel if you are undermining the state. And so step by step, we were able to get these rights. Now, it was done by the gradual inclusion of more and more people into those rights, whether it be women, that's Susan B. Anthony on the slide, or whether it be John Lewis at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, making sure that African-Americans had the right to vote, and we had a Civil Rights Act and a Voting Rights Act. All of these things were the steps along the way of gradually including more people into this process. 
it was not a steady process. There were a lot of fits and a lot of starts, a lot of advances, a lot of retreats. We're going through some of that today. We see the question of our rights being fought over. Are we retreating from some of the promises in the Declaration? Uh, but I believe, as King said, that the, mar that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. In other words, we have made progress through the years. It's not a finished trajectory, but it's one of the marks of this country is that each new generation finds a new way to figure out how do we interpret our rights and maybe how do we ensure those rights even better. The Constitution is the document that sort of sets it out. Uh, we, the people of the United States, just pause for a second there. It's an amazing first three words. We, the people. In other words, this document is not being handed down. It's not part of the divine right of kings. It's not saying that anybody else has helped provide this constitution to us. It is the first time you know, in history that a group of people just said, we're going to officially make a new constitution for ourselves. And they start with the words, we the people, because that's where it all begins. In order to form a more perfect union, that's a great line too, it means our union isn't perfect. And by the way, that's still part of our history. Not saying we've made it, not saying we've perfected our union, saying that we're always on a march to a more perfect union. Some of you may have had grammar teachers who objected to the idea that you could use the phrase more perfect, since perfect is not some something that can be adjusted, but we all know exactly what the framers meant when they said we were marching towards a more perfect union. And then the other thing is in there, they say we're going to promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to our posterity. If you think about that, those sometimes are in conflict a bit. In other words, if you're gonna promote the general welfare, you're gonna to have to ask people things. You're gonna to have to tax them. You're going to have to have regulation to say, this is in the general good. But you also wanna secure the blessings of liberty. So one of the things we're gonna look at is how sometimes this notion of promoting the general welfare conflicts with what an individual might wanna do, with individual liberty. But that's why this constitution is a living document. And the first thing we did to make it a living document was to add the first 10 amendments. And those first 10 amendments secure, or at least frame, what the basic liberties we have are. The freedom of the press, uh, the freedom of religion, free speech. And it's been this tale in which we said, okay, we're now gonna try to make it all a more perfect union. Let's begin by just remembering, we didn't have freedom of religion when the people first came here to the colonies. In fact, there were established churches. It was the Puritan church up in uh, the Bay, uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, and by the way, if you, had any heresies, if you objected to the teachings of the Puritan ministers, you kind of got kicked out. You had to go found a state like Rhode Island and start all over again. Maryland was Catholic. There were established religions, and we didn't start by saying, okay, we're going to allow everybody to worship how they please. But as we move towards creating the Constitution, we realized that religious tolerance was going to have to be part of the DNA of this nation. Likewise, there weren't uh, guarantees of a free press. Even if you publish something true, as I said, you could end up 
uh, being tried for sedition if it undermined the authorities. The important thing to realize is that when we talk about our rights, sometimes you know, we talk about freedom to do something, freedom to speak, freedom to worship, freedom uh, to print what you want or say what you want. But there are also economic rights that we have to think about. And it was Franklin Roosevelt who in a very important speech called the Four Freedoms Speech actually talked about that our rights and our liberties are not just individual liberties that give us the right to do something we might want to do, but there's other types of freedoms. And he, and he talked about what he called the four freedoms. And the first is the freedom of speech. That's it. This is Norman Rockwell did four wonderful uh, illustrations of the four freedoms. And there's the freedom of worship. But the other two are sort of economic, a freedom from fear and a freedom from want. And those have been harder for us to uh, create in this country. Because sometimes when you emphasize individual liberties, it takes away a bit from the common ground, the common good, what we're gonna do in common. So that, as I said, has always been one of the tensions in American history. How much are we gonna do for the commons? How much are we gonna to allow to be individual liberty? And if we want freedom from want, this was during the Great Depression, uh, right after the Great Depression that Franklin Roosevelt was talking about this, we're going to have to not only have individual freedoms, but we have to take care of the community. That's a big debate in politics. To what extent should we have social security, food stamps? Should we have social safety nets? Should we have health care? Those type of things. Freedom from fear, freedom from want. And to what extent should we leave that to the free market and to individuals? There's no right answer. The tale of American history is a tug of war between those two ways of thinking. But as we can see, I think, in my opinion, we keep pushing it forward to see if we can get it right.